American farmers have an amazing capability to produce. Nobody better in the world. But we have to be able to sell what we produce. I'm the fourth generation and uh, farmed with two brothers. Our charge, I think, was to steward this land, steward the resources that were given to us and, and give that fifth generation the same opportunity that dad gave us. I started in 1983. My dad was farming, but he didn't have a big enough operation to bring us in. We took the risk and paid 18 to 20 percent interest during our first farm. Early 80s, coming out of the 70s, man, things were just rocking and rolling. I mean, you couldn't do anything wrong. We had a weather event like we're having this year, excessive rain, and so we struggled. And by 1987, I was seriously considering quitting. There's a tremendous amount of pressure in a multi-generational family farm. We got underwater, so to speak. Uh, our land was worth less than some of our loan values were. We were upgrading our equipment to try to uh, build and build and grow, and, and, and we got caught. I always tell people the story that my dad farmed better than my grandfather, and we farmed better than our dad did. But it wasn't that they were doing a poor job. It was just they were using the tools they had in their toolbox. I think this we need to focus on is the next generation. And we need a reason to have our young people want to farm. And to do that, they need to be profitable. It's time to wake up and recognize the fact that agriculture's changing, technology's changing, and the world's changing. We either have to change with it or we'll go away. My goal has always been through my farming career, if there's an opportunity to invest in something that will help grind more corn, to give us better prices, I'm all in. The government right now is incentivizing low carbon fuels. They in helped incentivize the ethanol industry to begin with. I think the ethanol industry has saved the family farmer. With the ethanol industry needing a lower carbon intensity scores, so I thought it was pretty important that we, we were part of that. We've got two great ethanol plants with the reach of us here. Why would you not want to enhance that and create jet fuel if that's what's gonna happen. It's, it's a no-brainer. We don't have enough people telling them how good it is, you know? None of that's getting out there. We had about three miles of Summit Carbon pipeline go through our property. We negotiated, We've, we had great communications with land agents. We had a few things that we wanted done a little differently than some people's, and they agreed to it. They're an ag-based company, so they understand what our soils mean to us and how they need to be taken care of, and uh, I totally have respect for that. We've got one shot at this to let them through here, so I told them that. I said, this is what I feel I'm comfortable with, and she said, you're not being unreasonable, so you got a place to work with there. I like that about them. Just in the U.S., the aviation fuel is about a 35 to 50 billion gallon a year market. Even if we get the 3 billion gallons by 2030, that takes a big chunk of the excess corn off the ending stocks. That will help our prices dramatically. At 800 million bushels of corn, that's $200 million a year that goes back into farmers' pockets, goes back into those local economies. To fire departments, to schools, to education, community events, Fourth of July celebrations. I mean, it's, it's endless. And that's all based off agriculture. And if those local economies roll it six, seven times, do the math, billion dollar impact to local economies and, and, and the whole state. There's industries out there that want to build these plants, but they won't do it until the pipeline's done. The basic backbone is agriculture. And every time you can enhance that and create new opportunities with that, it's a win-win situation. The opportunity is huge and we just gotta figure out a way to get it done.